Good evening, all. And you may continue eating. We want to begin the program because we know that some have to go off for that uh, long night of study. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all this evening here to St. Thomas Moore for the Graustein Lecture on Environmental Justice. We know that Jeannie was a longtime advocate of these issues working on her own, working with the Archdiocese of Hartford and working through other uh, various agencies and so forth. And we're really pleased tonight that her husband Bill is with us and uh, Jeannie's brother, uh, Mark McCarthy, who's in from the West Coast, has joined us tonight too. So we're delighted to be here. As a good number of you know that uh, Jeannie passed away on January 18th. 18th, and her funeral was celebrated here, a faithful, faithful, every night, every Sunday here at this 5 p.m. Mass. Uh, her presence is missed here, as the presence of so many who have passed on this year. We think of Father Bob and several others who passed on from our community just in this past year. Uh, Bill's going to say a few words about uh, how he and Jeannie arrived at the, uh, this part of their lives in terms of environmental issues. I think that you're going to say, but if not... Uh, <laughs> Whatever you say is fine, okay? <laughs> thank you, Father Jerry, and welcome, and thank you for all for coming tonight. Um, for Particularly for those of you who knew uh, Jeannie, it's really a pleasure to, to see you and to have you here. For those of you who didn't know Jeannie, I thought I might just say a uh, a couple words about how she discovered her uh, vocation. She was something of a naturalist at heart. Uh, when she was in college, a friend talked her into going on an archaeological expedition in Wyoming. Full disclosure, a different friend talked me into going there too, and that's where we, <laughs> that's where we met. Uh, and that was a formative experience uh, for her, but in ways that only uh, kind of became apparent later. Part of it was the sort of intellectual work of archaeology, putting, discovering and then assembling pieces of a puzzle. Part of it was imaginative, too. We were uh, camping out uh, about 30 yards from the campsites of, ten th of hunters 10,000 years ago. And part of it was just a sensory appreciation of the uh, environment, what it feels like to be living outside and smell how sagebrush smells different in the cool of the morning than it does in the heat of the afternoon, or how in the uh, evening the heat would, from the sun-baked rocks would radiate off and warm us, how the stars would march across the sky at night. We'd see them in different positions as we uh, woke at different times in the night. Another critical part in Jean's formation was uh, St. Thomas More. It was here that she got to know some of the faculty in the natural sciences. And when they started about 25, 30 years ago, having some lunch gatherings with colleagues about uh, the relation between, or their experience of the intersection between faith and science, Jean started attending those and got so drawn into that that she enrolled as a special student in the Divinity School, and then as a not-so-special student, as, a, uh, as part of the uh, Master of Divinity program, did an internship at what was then the Archdiocese's Office of Urban Affairs, and began developing this program to reach out to parishes on stewardship of the environment and aspects of the environment as issues of social justice. I want to mention that here because it was a couple of chance conversations in college and following up on something that seemed improbable but intriguing, developing simultaneously different ways of comprehending the environment through intellect, sense, or imagination, and then the stimulation of the St. Thomas More community of being able to follow a curiosity and interest and having the support of the community as it uh, ripened into vocation. And it's in that spirit that, we're that we really welcome you to uh, this lecture, like so many others at St. Thomas More. It's both a celebration of the particular, 
but it's also part, I think, what our community's strength in helping each other explore and then dis discern and uh, develop our, our, our vocations and our spiritual maturation. So in that sense, I welcome you here, delighted you could be here, delighted uh, our speakers could be here, and I will leave it to Sister Jen to give them a proper introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for your ongoing participation and support of this community. We're always happy to have you here. It is my delight to introduce our speakers. Brother Kevin Colley is the Executive Director of the Thomas Berry Forum for Ecological Dialogue at Iona College. He produces a monthly newsletter on environmental concerns, the Carbon Rangers Ecozoic Times. Brother Kevin serves at the United Nations headquarters in New York as the main representative of Edmund Rice International, a non-governmental organization working in 30 countries on behalf of young people and the care of creation. Edmund Rice International holds special consultative status with the UN Economic and Social Council. Brother Kevin received his degree from Fordham University and he's a Christian brother. Sister Kathleen Dagnan is on the faculty of the Department of Religious Studies at Iona College where she founded the Iona Peace and Justice Studies program and the Iona Peace Institute in Ireland. She is also the founding director of the Iona Spirituality Institute which sponsors a variety of programs for spiritual development. She is the past president of the International Thomas Merton Society. Sister Kathleen received her master's in the history of Christian spirituality and her doctorate at Fordham University as well. She studied with Thomas Berry, the late theologian, which was one of her famous mentors. She's also a sacred songwriter and a psalmist and has composed over 200 songs, which she has posed through Scola Ministries in service to the church. It is my delight to welcome them both. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Thank you very much, Sister Jen, and thank you, Bill, and to also Jeannie's brother. And we are delighted that we have the honor to address you uh, for this Graustein Lecture in Environmental Justice. And we would like to salute all of you who are likewise serving in her spirit for care of earth and for environmental justice, for the poor caring for our common home. So we hope, we're very glad that you've actually eaten already because we think that uh, this conversation could be a little difficult on uh, your appetite. But nevertheless, we wish to share with you our ministry, Brother Kevin, and mine, and our, the colleagues whom we have left back at Iona, our ministry of the great work, we are now beginning to call ourselves catechists of Laudato Si. We are hoping that we can serve the teaching, this new teaching of our church on integral environmental justice, and to announce a uh, time, a new time of salvation. And so we're asking, what time is it? And we are offering that it's time for the great work in earnest. The great work, of course, as Thomas Berry announced it, will of course take generations, it will take centuries, perhaps millennia, to rectify the disturbance that we have brought to the very, very finely tuned systems of our planet Earth, which have evolved over millions and billions of years, as we know. Because evolution offers a one-time endowment, a, one, a unidirectional endowment for the causes and conditions that have given rise to the flourishing of this glorious planet of ours. 
And so as Thomas says, we're not looking for Pax Romana, the peace of any empire, nor are we looking simply toward Pax Humana, the peace of the human community, but we are struggling and laboring for Pax Kaya, the peace of earth and every being on earth. And this is the original and the final peace, the peace granted by whatever power it is that brings our world into being. Let me do this a cappella with you. Will you, will you sing an, an acclamation as we move through into our conversation? Listen, my soul, this is your task. Listen, my soul, this is your task. To bless the earth and all her creatures. To bless the earth and all her creatures. And to walk the way of mindfulness. And to walk the way of mindfulness. Rely upon our planet whose sacrifice supports you. Bow low and yield dominion. Rise up and take your place. Listen, my soul, this is your task. Listen, my soul, this is your task. To bless the earth and all her creatures. And to walk the way of mindfulness. And to walk the way of mindfulness. Thank you for the, the lovely and gentle start. Um, uh, I usually introduce myself as the guy who's going to ruin your day because of some of the starkness of the messages that we have to deliver. But we have uh, come to a decision recently about what we know and what we should say. So we no longer, as the expression goes, hide any slides. We will try to give you as much as we know up to the moment. And I will use a, a number of things that I have learned through my connections at the United Nations and the long discussions we've been having in the last couple of years about sustainable development goals and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, et cetera. So that's part of what's informing this conversation. We are also grateful for uh, Pope Francis his encyclical letter, which was some years ago, but is now getting some traction. We had a little conversation earlier about what's going on in parishes and how this is becoming a conversation that might be beginning to take shape, in particular among young people. We'll talk about that as we go through this. We are working on, a, from our perspective, a new catechesis for Catholics of, as we're calling it, the sixth extinction, the moment we're in, in the Anthropocene. When Pope Francis framed his argument, he talked about the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. He linked them. He reminded us a number of times that his encyclical was not an ecology encyclical. It was a combination of ecological and social justice. And he linked them and he always links them when he speaks. We know that the world is in a state right now, the uh, Oxfam people have told us that eight men own half the world's wealth. We believe this is linked to our challenge to climate change because when we decide we need to do certain things, we always find there's a pushback. So we've, we established that about eight men own the same wealth as the 3.6 billion people who make up the poorest of half of humanity. The Oxfam folks say that an economy for the 99% shows that the gap between the rich and poor is far greater than had been feared. These are not USA numbers, these are global numbers. 
it's something to hold in mind as we work through these issues. What does this look like? We'll just take a quick look at what's happening. We can see on the left, the favela, and on the right, you'll notice each balcony with its own swimming pool, maybe 100 feet from the other half. <coughs> Hong Kong is probably one of the most densely populated parts of the world, and the workers in Hong Kong live very closely and in tremendously squalid conditions. That's just one portion of Mexico City. What are people enduring in these days? And what about this equality question? And in Laudato Si, Francis speaks about water, not once or twice or three times, but 47 times he makes reference to the human right to water. Just one way of framing our dilemma here. This is a story, so to speak. So the story is now, I'll give it to you in three numbers. This is some time ago, maybe two years ago. Bill McKibben put this together for us. Three numbers. The first number is two. The second number is about 567. The third number is 2700. We'll see what that is all about. Two degrees centigrade is the limit that we established at the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015 that we were hoping we could maintain the global surface temperature under a two degree rise and so preserve the current state of affairs on the planet. So the two degree became the challenge. A large number of member states push back against that. Mostly there were small island developing states who would not sign the document with a two degree limit. They said we would be signing our own death warrant. They demanded and pushed for what they call ambition around this and they asked for 1.5 degrees. A lot of compromise when you have 192 nations, num a number of them working at an existential level. So the one five degrees is really what the target is hoped for. We'll talk about the targets in a few minutes. But two is our number for tonight. The second number, 565, that's the number of gigatons of CO2 that we would see as a budget for two degrees of warming. If we keep under 565 gigatons, of carbon burned, we, will, we have a chance to not exceed the two degrees limit in the atmospheric warming. So two and five, six, five. Third number, 2795 gigatons. That is the amount of reserves already known to the fossil fuel industry and already claimed by the fossil fuel industry and they have every intention to burn those gigatons because they're part of their property, so to speak. You can see our problem. If the fossil fuel industry moves forward and burns what they own, it's almost five times as much CO2, as we know, we are limited to if we're going to stay under two degrees. <laughs> Often enough, you hear arguments about, well, China and India burn more carbon. True to the extent that, yes, that's how it goes when you add it all up. However, in terms of per capita carbon footprint, this is how it works out. Total equivalent is that left-hand axis, one, two, three, four, five, and six tons of equivalent carbon per capita. You can see on the right-hand side, the US of A, the largest per capita carbon burner. And way down in the left-hand corner, 
India and China. That's per capita. Again, they burn a lot, but they have more people. So it works out in that way. However, we need to pay attention to those issues. This is our challenge. You can see on this little thermometer graph, three colors. This is from IPCC. That's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. These are their policy warnings. This was issued in October, I think, of 2018, ahead of the climate conference in Poland. It was to let leaders of delegations know what you were up against in terms of what you need to talk about in uh, Poland. And the goals, you can see in the green there, there's the famous 1-5. We really want to make the 1-5 work. That's what the planet needs. The blue is what the countries propose. That is, when everybody got together in Paris and they all said, we promise to do X, Y, Z, and they handed in, so to speak, their homework. Everybody handed in their homework. They counted, added it up, and said, okay, if every country does what they promised, we'll be at 3.3. So even if we keep our Paris promises, we're going to miss the mark. And the third proposition, the third problem is measuring it now in the yellow. That's currently what's really happening. So not only were the promises made by individual nations not strong enough, but actually we're not even keeping those promises. And we're headed to 4.2 degrees. The challenge is this, this is again, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Within the next decade, human caused carbon dioxide emissions need to fall 45% below 2010 levels, and then the big number by 2050, net carbon has to be at zero. Another way to get it for yourself. The left-hand graph, the gray, is what's happening right now. In 2016, this is when the graph was put together by the World Resources Institute. The red section is where we're headed now. That's the recent measurement. We're burning at that rate. The blue, if we want to get to 1.5, we have to be at the level of the blue graph. And we just saw how we're missing that one. And then the big scary number is by 2050, we have to be at zero. Zero net carbon by 2050. We know that climate change has a number of impacts. The heat and the duration of heat waves makes people sick. We know that has happened before. We've seen perhaps, not recently, but two years ago in Pakistan, they had the army out in the desert digging trench graves, preparing for the deaths of people in the coming heat waves. They knew they were going to have deaths from heat. That's one of the hottest places on the planet in those summer months, 120 degrees day after day after day. Uh, even Morocco, North Africa. I spoke once with the, one of the Moroccan ambassadors to the UN who said they just completed a month of temperatures above 100 degrees every day for a month in a place with very little air conditioning, very little way to, to cool the water. So these places are already in tr extreme difficulty. The second problem has been the disasters, severe weather. We've seen that even in this country. We've seen it recently in Africa, where they're getting cyclones that they haven't seen before on the east coast of Africa. And warmer seasons, warmer water, range for ticks, mosquitoes expands. More and more we're seeing diseases 
that we haven't seen before in areas that they haven't been in before. So climate change has already made impacts on the planet. A way to collect, collect all of it in one place, so to speak, this is from the World Meteorological Organization. You just go around the graph, you can see in the upper left quadrant, undernourishment, floods, ocean acidification, climate change threatens peatland. That's the bogs and the peat bogs around the world, particularly in the Siberian part of the world. The permafrost is beginning to melt. It's losing its resiliency and it's releasing methane. Deaths with heat waves and wildfire will increase. Internal displacements, we haven't talked about that much, but there are climate refugees now moving around the planet. The U.S. military is very conscious of that. It's worked it into their uh, risk assessment every four years. They take a, uh, a look at that and they know that's a serious threat to world security. Global oxygen is decreasing. The displaced by weather and climate disasters is increasing. So there's a, pardon me, a creepy graph about what is happening. Well, we're here in New Haven. It's baked in, that's the real challenge. Even if we were to go to net zero carbon tomorrow morning, we still have, yes, centuries of warming already in the pipeline coming at us. Even if we stopped burning carbon tomorrow morning. It's a real massive challenge. So that's our question about what time is it now? <clears throat> it's time to look at the reality that's in front of us as best we can. Shall we talk about Greta? How many know who Greta is? A couple of hands. Greta is a, a young woman from Sweden. In this picture, she's sitting on the steps of the Swedish parliament in a yellow rain slicker with a, her sign she made on her kitchen table. My Swedish isn't great, but I can translate it. School strike for climate. She told her parents one morning, I have to do something. I'm going to school strike for climate. Her parents naturally said, why is this a good idea? Couldn't you think of something else? No, I have to do this. And she tells you in her various interviews, they could not stop me. So every Friday, starting in August, she got on her bicycle and bicycled over to Parliament and sat on the steps. And for quite a while, nobody paid attention. There's this little kid on the front steps until somebody said, what's going on? And then the police came and said, you can't do this. And they moved her. But she was shrewd enough to have it on her Facebook page. And then the world started to pay attention to Greta. So as of late, she has made quite an impression. Now, one of the things about Greta is she has talked about this in her own world. She is on the spectrum for autism. She's a very black and white view of the world. She is chronologically 16, but she looks much younger presents much younger, but she is quite an impressive ambassador for let's do something. We'll d get a chance, I think, to see in a few minutes a, a video that we have of uh, Greta. Did we move that one, Kathleen? No, it's coming. Let's go to this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we thought that uh, it would be very important, and especially Kevin and I are very dedicated, uh, not so much to our own generation, but to your generation, to the generations that we serve at Iona College, the ones who are coming uh, behind us. Greta Thunberg has gone to places of power, and she has uh, 
confronted her elders by saying, all of you keep saying to us um, that we, the elders, owe it to you to give you hope. But she says, but we don't want your hope. We don't want to be hopeful. We want you to panic. We want you to feel the fear that we feel every day. We want you to act. I want you to act as you would in a crisis. I want you to act as if the house were on fire, because it is. So we have all been struggling with this understanding of how do we stand in the Anthropocene? Where is a place to stand during the sixth extinction, particularly if we're Christians and people of faith of this era. A very uh, powerful thought leader, uh, American, Paul Hawken, who is the initiator of the project Drawdown, which has actually conceived of over a hundred ways to draw down carbon in the atmosphere to the levels that Kevin has been describing, <laughs> wants to also get in on this conversation on hope. And he said, from my point of view, which is, I suppose, in, informed by the Buddhist tradition, hope is a pretty mask for fear. That's very difficult for people of faith to hear, I think, since we understand it as a divine energy, a theological virtue. But he says you can't have hope without fear, whether you're aware of it or not. What we need is to be fearless, not hopeful. Because to be hopeful means that our actions are based on fear from his perspective. And no action based on fear can really be very useful. In some sense, hope implies that there is a solution within the condition itself that is going to spring up and rectify what we hope to be rectified. But Vaclav Havel says, Hope isn't really the conviction that something is going to turn out well. It's the conviction that I'm going to do something, no matter how it turns out, because it's important to do that. And that seems to be the existential challenge to Christians, to people of faith, to people who are awake of this Anthropocene. So we'd like to let this young prophet, Greta, speak to us now and know that she has begun, she has instigated, she has initiated, she's activated and ignited a real wave of young people around the world who are saying, if we will not act, they will. And they are inviting us to follow them. And while Kevin is doing that, uh, I'd just like to remind us uh, of a beautiful poem by Charles Tegui. And some of you may know that wonderful French poet and his deep, deep, deep commitment to wrestling with the reality of hope in challenging and critical times. And he has composed a beautiful poem in which he says, puts on the lips of of the divine, I am, says God, master of the three virtues. And he describes, faith is a faithful wife, and charity is an ardent mother. But my little hope is a tiny girl. This is the kind of hope that is fearless and courageous. And so one of the things we feel most ardently after encountering a prophet like Greta is the very powerful mandate that comes to us from Francis, 
uh, our Christian, the Catholic leader, Catholic community leader, who wants to say that we must dedicate ourselves to intergenerational climate justice. And certainly this is something that Jeannie Grastein was very committed to. Um, because this world really belongs to some of the young, youngers in this room and the youngers even behind them, the gorgeous little ones we saw at the liturgy this evening. So Thomas Berry, who is our teacher and whose great work we feel obligated to, uh, to announce and to share as a wisdom path in this very challenging time, wants to remind us of the same thing. We have to, as elders, give the youngers a sense of the great work and do everything that we can to support them and encourage them, encourage them to take up this great work because they are the ones that are going to be leading us, leading this planet into whatever future it has. We have to give those human beings of the generation of Anthropocene some sense of how to fulfill the great work in an effective manner. This is what Thomas said to us when he came to Iona decades and decades ago, and this is why we have dedicated uh, a living memorial in the Berry, Thomas Berry Forum to him. The great work now as we move into this new millennium is to carry out the transition from this period of this human devastation of the earth to a period when humans are going to be present on the planet in a mutually enhancing way. And so that really does require the reimagination, or as Thomas would say, the reinvention of the human. If the central pathology of our time, well, of the last recent human generations that's led to the terminus, termination of this flourishing Xenozoic period is the radical discontinuity that exists between the human and the non-human. The rage, as Thomas spoke of it, the rage in the human against the conditions under which life is offered to us then we have to uh, undertake a renewal of life based on continuity between the human and other kind, such that we are fostering a single integral community. And once this continuity is recognized and accepted, and he would say accepted in jurisprudence, accepted in education, accepted in healthcare, accepted in the political order, then we will have fulfilled the basic condition that's going to enable us to really be present to the earth in a beneficial and benign way. So the present urgency is to begin thinking within the context of a planet. I always say to my students in our, in our uh, environmental theology classes, we have to think like a planet uh, th that will allow us to, to take up this challenge. Now, this is a very important piece this grieving the loss of what we have already lost. And also coming to a, a position of sobriety and a courage about our reality in this moment. It is the challenge to ministers. It is the challenge to educators. This is what we should be talking about in every convening of our faith and educational and political uh, forums. We may be watching the earth dying and so we have to ask ourselves, each of us, therefore, what am I being asked to do? And of course, this is never a solo operation. We are always doing this in concert and in community with one another. And Thomas is going to give us pathway, and that's where we're going to finish our conversation this evening.
And the first one is he is going to summon us to a new intimacy with this beautiful, beautiful living planet and with all our relations within it. It is intimacy with the natural world that is the starting place for this transformation. By regaining this intimacy, we begin to understand the ramifications of what it means to lose so much of it, uh, so much of Earth's ice, of, its, of her species, of her biosphere. Some people will want to say, well, geez, there are so many species of X, Y, or Z. I mean, do we need all of them? And the answer, of course, is yes or Earth would not have gone to the trouble these millions of years to generate such a magnificent design. For so long, we've lived in a world where, never, where many have never experienced this kind of love and intimacy with the natural world, and that's why we can treat it as a collection of objects for human use and not a communion of subjects to be celebrated. So uh, Thomas offers us three reorientations. And they're questions, they're provocations. I think they're koans. They're almost Im uh, they are impossible uh, to answer except by your existential life, except by your practice. And they are these three that would lead us to a new mind state and a new kind of ecozoic, in Thomas's words, ecozoic lifestyle. The first question that we always have to have on our minds is, is my next thought, word, or deed viable, sustainable, for this planet. Is my next thought, word, and deed, does it, do they foster intimacy with the planet, a sense of communion? The third he offers, does my next, is my next thought, word, or deed an act of celebration of this planet? Because neither Thomas nor Francis Bergoglio wants us to be grim uh, environmentalists. Francis will say, whatever it is we are facing into, we must go forth singing. The last one that Kevin and I have added is the one about intergenerational justice and social justice. It is the axiom of hearing the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Does my next thought, word, or deed lift up or continue to push down those who are being harmed first and worst in this uh, climate crisis. The question about sustainability and viability is going to develop a new mode of presence, of presencing. And the question has to be, is this Earth-centered or is it me-centered? Uh, how much of my own pleasure, power, possessions am I willing to invest, invest in this new moment as I divest so much from it? We have to begin to realize we are a communion, a community of living species, and that the planet is given not to and for the human alone, but for the whole living Earth community. The second question has to do with an organic economy and to follow the cycle of being able to um, practice a mode of living where I am engaging the ever-renewing, uh, excuse me, let me go back, ever-renewing processes of the earth. And Thomas really calls for this virtue that is so rooted in the lives of people of conscience and faith, which is self-limitation. 
and the capacity to accept the challenging aspects of the natural world, which are the primary conditions for our creative existence within the community of life systems. So the new discipline for the Anthropocene is to surrender our wonder world mentality and accept the discipline of self-limitation of my carbon footprint. So we need to be present then to the community of life of which we're part. So the next question is, to what degree am I living a life of intimacy with and as and on this glorious planet? How much do I love it? Because Thomas would always say, you know, we'll, we will only save what we love. And we have to risk cultivating that loving intimacy. It's going to heal our existential loneliness to a great deal. And that existential loneliness is what's driving us to so many of the distractions of pleasure and, and waste. So um, how shall we do this? To invite a, a new modality of life, and that, of course, means the uh, renovation of our of our cultural institutions. It's going to have to happen in schools like Yale, where I know I'm sure it is, like Iona, like the Montessori School that is here in the basement of this place that I got to see yesterday. It's going to have to be in all our churches, synagogues, temples, dojos, all of our ethical culture societies, wherever there are people who are willing to wake up and accept the challenge of maturing as a human being. Uh, Every being has the kind of spontaneities that we want to honor and admire and love. And so we have to ask the next question, is our next thought or deed a way of celebration? And Thomas used to say that we will continue this modality of celebration by sharing a glo the glorious story of the universe together by reimagining our religious lives. It's time for what he would call a meta-religious movement where the earth is the primordial celebrant and we enter into her liturgies and celebrations. And then the last one that we will leave you with is, is the one that we have known from the beginning because this is the one, of course, that Jesus underscores the most. This is doing unto our neighbor as we would have them do unto us, except now we know that the neighbor is the mollusk and the bat and the bee and all of our relations is my next thought, word or deed fostering conversion to solidarity with those who are suffering first and worst, the ones who do the least to impact our present catastrophic climate crisis. The question is, am I willing in my own personal life to divest, to revoke the license, the personal license that I have uh, assumed, the social license, political, economic license to wreck creation? And so Thomas will leave us with this, unless my brother wants to say something else. Okay. Are we? That the challenge now, of course, is to create the new language for this new moment as we go through. Thomas wants to say, you know, uh, we have to realize that, of course, it is a degraded planet, and we can't restore all that has gone and we've lost. But that doesn't mean that this cannot be the most extraordinary time for the human species. I always say, I've said it yesterday when we were all together, that I think the age of Homo sapiens is over. I think our species, in the main, in the whole, we, we seem to be too destructive. 
or ignorant. But that doesn't mean that we are not at a new evolutionary inflection point where we are being summoned to be the beginning of a new iteration of humankind, maybe not Homo sapiens, but maybe Anthropos, Sophia, truly wise humans. We need a new language. We new, need a new sense of what it means to be human. Of course, we were Iter reiterating the oldest, oldest themes. Haven't we just come from a Eucharist and a liturgy that's celebrating the new creation and the new human being that we are in Christ? For those of us who are Christian, for Buddhists and Muslims and people of all religious faiths, they have their own way of speaking about the novelty, the rebirth that could happen and so the earth really is in our hands. So let us conclude with an anthem of, uh, of fierce courage and willingness and sing. Listen, my soul, this is your task. Listen, my soul, this is your task to bless the earth and all her creatures, to bless the earth and all her creatures, and to walk the way of mindfulness, and to walk the way of mindfulness. A very special blessing to all of you who are students and all of you who come behind the elders. I'm 71. We are 71. Uh, we uh, dedicate the rest of our lives to, this, to the proclamation of this gospel. And we do it for the sake of all of you with great love and great confidence that you will take it up and carry it forward. Thank you. Thank you to both of you for a very challenging presentation. And uh, we have time for probably one or two questions. As people are putting their thoughts together and just letting this soak in, I'm wondering if you can talk about where you see hope today in, in your work with students or in other places. Where do you see that hope? Yes, the, the hope question has to be in front of all of us. and. Um, uh, Sister Kathleen is in class every day. I'm at the United Nations on a weekly basis. Uh, frankly, uh, my uh, regular thought about the UN has been uh, the, the Christian religious sisters I meet there, the Catholic nuns, are the best chance that the UN has to develop a conscience. Because for too many member states, it's about the member state it has to be and they're only looking after their place and their situation. And too, too often, politically, it's very toxic. However, there were signs of hope. During the deliberations about the Sustainable Development Goals, which were adopted in 2015, the day that Pope Francis spoke at the UN, he spoke in the morning, you may have seen that, that afternoon, the General Assembly endorsed the Sustainable Development Goals for the next 15 years for every nation on the planet. 17 goals. We're still obviously working through that. But it was a sign of encouragement that they were deliberately scheduling the vote the day that Pope Francis was there. That's a hopeful sign. They are watching and they're listening. Also, uh, at least one or two of the ambassadors who were there that I happen to know personally talked about the influence of the faith groups at the Paris Climate Agreement. 
there was a significant push by members of the faith groups to go to Paris, to be present, to be around the conversations, to be injecting themselves periodically into those conversations. Even though it's a flawed document, it's a better and stronger document. Uh, sometime after that, I was in a hallway, uh, Ambassador Macharia Kamau, who was from Kenya, who presided over three years of those conversations. I said hello, I'm just greeting him, you know, friendly hello, and he stopped and he came back to me and he said, I want you to know that your Pope was completely important to the success of those Paris talks, even though he wasn't there in person. There are signs that there is an influence going on. And then uh, tonight, I hope you got a sense of the hope, watching this little tiny child, Greta, speaking, that was in front of the uh, European Parliament. She spoke at Davos, to the World Economic Forum. She spoke in front of the European Commission. She herself led four different climate marches in Europe on the 15th of March in London. That's still in Europe, and not done yet. <laughs> and we had, uh, in the British Parliament this week, Labor has introduced a resolution to declare a climate emergency for the UK. Now that's quite striking because it's not been on the, the agenda there and it's basically a test to see if they can get both parties to say yes or no to this challenge. Greta has just been in London, just spoke to the, uh, not in Westminster, but to an assembly there. The same message, her, her entreaty is the same everywhere. And she was able at least to bring that clarity. Uh, I'll leave with the thought. Someone has described her as quite a striking new figure on the world scene. They, she's been nominated for the Nobel Prize. Uh, someone wrote about her and said, you can see her integrity from outer space. That gives me hope. I think one of the things that uh, Brother Kevin and I have great concern about is, as he said today, how many of the slides do we hide? And we have made a decision, I don't know, we have to keep discerning it, uh, how good it is to let everybody know how bad it is. Uh, because nobody wants to walk away deflated and I and by the way I don't walk away deflated that's not to say that I'm not in grief uh, but to be honest I mean as we've been saying I, I'm an urban cowgirl I've lived in cities my whole life and I haven't seen half of the beauty of this world about which we're speaking so Perhaps, you know, not having ever looked into the eyes of some of these magnificent relatives of mine, my relations, uh, I don't have the pang as deep. But for me, the great hope is that nothing we can do can destroy this planet entirely. And secondly, uh, now... Uh, as they say, the jig is up. We have got to, we've got to really come and and uh, step up to the to this profession of faith that we've always been making about being new beings in Christ, or however one formulates one's uh, commitment to a constant evolution of this human nature, we need to be evolving beyond this egocentricity, this anthropocentrism of this uh, Anthropocene. And that gives me hope. It's a great challenge. I mean, it's an, it's an amazing challenge. And I do look out into the faces of my students every single day, and I I bow to them. I bow to them at the beginning of class. I bow to them at the end of class because they are this future. And I have confidence in them. And um, 
and but for elders, we've just got to be on their side. We've got to be their allies and got to be doing whatever it is we need to do. Thank you. So uh, I was a student. I was a student of the Barrigans back a long time ago. And of course, uh, what we've heard this evening is that there are eight individuals who possess more money than the rest of the world. This, this is so evil, I do not understand how it is we can hope for anything but what we need to do is we need to have a revolution of some sort. So it's my feeling that asking the young people to establish an intimacy with the, with the planet, yes, I think they should do it. But I think it's long past the time for civil disobedience on the part of all of us, because it appears as though nothing is changing. This 13-year-old youngster, uh, are we not all embarrassed? Are we not all shamed by what it is that is happening to our planet? And talking about it, thinking about it, is not really going to accomplish anything. We need to actually somehow invigorate all of us so that we protest and perhaps disobey. Yes, it's, it's uh, certainly on the list. I, I want to thank uh, the gentleman for his comments. And uh, to say also, uh, we, we did hide a slide tonight. We didn't tell him about the Sunrise Movement, uh, which is going on. 350, you may have heard of that, uh, 350.org, working on this. A lot of young people. And uh, Greta's own uh, spectacular leadership has created a whole generation of young people all over the planet. To, to step up, so to speak, in that question. The Sunrise Movement is the United States version, and they're the ones pushing the Green New Deal. And they're very young folks, and they were the people that may have read about them the first day of the new Congress. They went to Pelosi's office, Speaker of the House, and sat had a sit-in at Nancy Pelosi's office saying, we demand action on climate, and the Green New Deal was their, their charge. And famously, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the new congressperson from New York, saw that tweet, and instead of just tweeting back, she went down to Nancy Pelosi's office and joined the sit-in. Quite an extraordinary moment for a freshman congressperson to show up at the leader's office on the first day in a protest. So things do happen, and in this Stepping into the streets is an issue. Extinction Rebellion, you may have heard of them. It's called XR. They were in the streets of London not too long ago. They were in Westminster at the Parliament, gluing themselves to benches to bring some attention to this. So there are things happening. So I certainly hope we can keep the movement going. There's another student climate strike coming up in May. So let's keep our eyes and ears open to that and see if we can't keep that energy going. And also, thank you so much for that. I grew up in the Berrigan era myself and have been arrested twice and have been cultivating my students in the capacity for civil disobedience. And we did hide those slides. We just didn't put them in uh, of our own, uh, mm, how do we say, cohorts of students that we have taken to D.C. and mm, surrounded f the White House three times during the Obama administration. I mean, three times at the same moment to uh, bring a halt to the XL, which actually happened and then it got reinstated. But uh, we are going to, we, we continue to do this and we keep training. This is part of the very work, uh, the great work we feel is that we need to be um, introducing students who may not have that 
either the inclination, the instinct, or the or the sense of practice of uh, uh, assuming uh, civil responsibility. So thank you. I, I know it's very important. Yeah. Um, hello. Uh, sorry, I have a quiet voice, so just let me know if you if you can't hear me. Um, but my name is Allison Rana. Um, I'm a PhD student in religious studies and the environmental humanities here. Um, I was also at the UN for some of the EcoSoc talks with um, Yungo, um, and I also do some sustainability education. And when I first got into sustainability education, the big message that they had for us to teach students and our peers was change your light bulbs and see if you can get a hybrid. And that was a big part of you know, this is what you can do to contribute, vote. Um, and I still find myself often in those situations where I'm speaking to other, um, to my peers and also to undergraduates when I'm teaching, trying to direct them for how they can make meaningful change and I can teach them all of the philosophy that I know and I can talk to them about my own work, but I wonder after presentations like this, um, is there anything that the people in this room can leave with that might feel a little bit more acute in the kind of change that we can make than, than waiting for November or making the small changes in our lives um, that will really um, have a more, of, more of an impact? Mm. Yeah, thank you. I'm sure Kevin can speak to that and I will too. Thank you. Thank you very much, yes. Um, I think Bill McKibben, who's familiar to many of us, uh, has said, people ask him, what can an individual do? And he says, stop being an individual. <laughs> get involved, find partners, get into groups, find a group that's working near you, organize, establish uh, a presence, but, but basically stop being an individual and get into a group. That's the most important thing. And uh, almost every time I'm at, at a conference, as you know, at the UN, there's always somebody who says, one thing we can all do is eat less meat. Be ambitious. Bring ambition. Yeah. And ambition. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I am with students all day long, my joy. Um, one of the things that we've been doing now in my religious studies class, religious studies, environmental studies class, is we've been studying the sustainable development goals. So they have had a challenge to select one and to begin to try to really probe how this gets to be implemented and how they get to be able to push the goal. Because uh, they're not just goals out there for somewhere for someone else. I mean, these goals really are uh, articulating or expressing almost a kind of lifestyle strategy. Um, and then I've asked them to pair that that goal with some of the pragmatic proposals of drawdown, Paul Hawkins' project. And uh, it's amazing how we're tr seeing a real synergy between those two things and how they are all reflexive back on me, us. But my dilemma is that it's very, very hard to pierce the pleasure principle in Americans. This is where I live and work. So, uh, I mean, maybe it's everywhere. But to to really be willing to really act up and act out in this creative way is so challenging. There was a gentleman with us yesterday, I don't know if he's here today, at the end of our conversation we had a retreat on some of this. Well, it wasn't really on some of this, but um, it turned into this. Um, his wife said to him at the break, uh, I think I'm gonna become a vegetarian. And he looked at her and he said, well, I'm not. <laughs> And you know, he's the chef in the house. So he said, um, he accused me of, of, of breaking his, of his marriage. And, and you know, it, it, was, it was perfect because that's really the issue. To what degree are, am I, we, willing to divest 
of certain privileges, of certain practices, of certain habits. That's the way a cultural movement begins, right? We know that. Um, and so I do agree with Kevin I do, and, and this gentleman here, who, because we are speaking also of political action uh, and public action. But we must engage with organizations that are a larger corporate person than myself. And then we've got to bring the deep personal habits and commitments. I try to stay close to a Buddhist friend of mine because she's so, she makes me so uncomfortable. She really walks the walk. And that's what I feel we really need to do. Until that happens, I don't know what else could happen. And that's the dilemma. Until that happens, the, the uh, temperature keeps going up, really. What do you think? I know that one place, the reason that I think I'm going into environmentalism from the background, from the foundation, a lot of what you've talked about today, about this not being a, 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 a movement that freezes or a way of thinking that freezes, but something that needs to remain in motion uh, through, through all the facets of a life, um, and that includes the daily habits that you're talking about and the activism that you're talking about and the collective action that important thing that we talked about today. Um, but I think that not everyone has the resources or knows where to go to make those things happen. And so maybe that's a place that we, especially our community here, can, can work on is making it accessible to more people. Mm -hmm. And become that center. You know, to become contagious. Contagious. To become that center right here. Um, you know, one of the things that's really helpful uh, for me anyway, I had the privilege of being Thomas Berry's student. And uh, right here at Yale, you have the joy of having two of his principal disciples, Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm, and they've really done so much work of getting the, uh, the, the universe story uh, and the journey of the universe uh, paradigm into the currency. Uh, in our world. And between Barry and Teilhard, there's been something really helpful to me, empowering, encouraging, and from Teilhard's point of view, definitely uh, the, uh, the energy of hope comes from an awareness that everything is evolving, and so is my species, so is my kind. And I have the opportunity, the responsibility, the moral responsibility, the, the species, the, the DNA responsibility to bring my species forward in this great evolutionary process. Um, and to become that new human, that ecozoic human person. Um, almost makes me want to have had children. Uh, but that, you know, that's, that's why you have children. That's why you give birth to the future. Because you give birth to this new race that might be able to, um, you know, be worthy of something as beautiful as, as what we've been gifted with. Thank you both, and thank you to Bill and to Jeannie's inspiration for this series. We're grateful for all of you being here tonight. Uh, there are books for sale out in the hallway. If you'd like to have them signed, you can bring them back in. And there'll be a light reception for students in rig study right after this. Thank